Hi, I'm Ralph Horn, Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation in the College of Design and Social Context. And I've got with me today Professor Julian Thomas, who is the Director of the Enabling Capability Platform for Social Change, uh, but also, of course, the inaugural uh, Director of the new Centre of Excellence in Automated Decision Making and Society. So, hi Julian and welcome. Hi Ralph, thanks. Great to be here. This is really all about this new Centre of Excellence, which is a, a fantastic thing to have here hosted at RMIT. Um, I'm interested in the two words at the end of the title, and society. I suspect they may be front and centre of what this project is all about. And I wondered if you could start by telling us a little bit about yeah. uh, how society fits in uh, yes. to this, this centre of excellence. Yeah, so, so absolutely. So this is a centre which has its own centre of gravity in, in the social sciences and in the humanities. We're working with colleagues from computer science and other technological disciplines, but it really is about the social consequences of these new technologies of automation, what we call automated decision-making systems, that we're most concerned. We're concerned with the social consequences of these systems. We're concerned with how they're changing society in all kinds of ways. And we're concerned about how society, in fact, shapes these technologies as well. So we can't just understand them as purely technological constructs. Mm. They're the kinds of things which you need to take a complex view of. Mm. And we think you can only really understand how they're going to play out for us, why they're going to be so significant, if you bring all of those social disciplines and perspectives to bear, as well as the purely scientific ones. So can you give me uh, maybe some examples of how you see uh, this centre helping us to understand shifts in urban systems uh, arising from kind of automation as, as described? So yes, so we see automated decision making changing the way our cities work and our experience of them and the kinds of problems that we're dealing with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Nobody, for example, decided that our residential apartment buildings should suddenly become hotels. Mm -hmm. Nobody decided that our quiet residential back streets should all of a sudden become busy roads. Mm. But these things have happened and they've happened because of a specific kind of automation, because of the development of automated decision-making machines that we call recommendation systems, which now tell people where they might stay if they're visiting a city or which way to drive home. And the, these have extraordinary effects because they've been designed to maximise the benefits for their users and for the corporate platforms that develop them. Mm. So public and social interest considerations have been left out of the design of those systems. If we understand them a lot better, using work with our colleagues in the, in the technological sciences and our social sciences and humanities to get a better feel for how this is actually playing out on the ground, then we might be able to redesign those systems so they actually take into account the fact that there's a public interest in quiet streets, in quiet neighbourhoods sometimes, as well as an interest in making sure that people can get home and have places to stay. So um, if, I, if I follow up on that, um, uh, can I ask you to talk a bit about how the researchers will investigate uh, the kind of uneven consequences of automation that you're talking about? What kinds of research methods do you think across the different disciplines you've got involved will be used? So you've got to do a whole lot of different things. And this is one of the things that makes the centre complex, mm -hmm. makes the research program larger mm -hmm. than it would be for a, a regular research project that we might do in just one discipline. Mm -hmm. Because to understand the problem we've been talking about, as I said, you've got to draw on skills from very specific computational disciplines, data science, and you've also got this problem of how do we understand what is happening. Mm -hmm. So for example, our colleagues in digital ethnography mm -hmm. who are expert in understanding the uses of technologies and how people adapt them and change them mm -hmm. are also going to actually be vital. Mm -hmm. Then we also need to draw on our experts in economics, in public policy and law who can look at the regulatory structures, whether they're formal or informal, embodied in code, mm -hmm or embodied in law or in local policies to understand better how they can be 
modified to achieve the sorts of results we want, which actually balance public and private interests, mm. because the alternative is just banning these things. Yeah. And we've seen that happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So a better result is possible. Mm. It is possible to mm. apply a public interest set of principles to this, but you need to draw on all of those areas of expertise in order to do that. Mm. And how will the centre work with what we might call end users uh, to ensure that this new knowledge that's created around uh, the consequences of automation gets taken up in public policy and in practice? Well, our end users are not end users. Mm -hmm. They're partners in the research and they're involved in the design of the mm -hmm. research from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. They're also end users, mm -hmm. we hope, and we hope we have a lot of end users, but we're particularly interested in this collaborative relationship. Mm -hmm. So who are we going to work with? We're going to work with technology companies. Yep like Google, mm -hmm. who can help us understand better mm -hmm. the way in which these systems are designed, the technologies behind them. We're going to work with legal and regulatory and policy experts outside the universities who are involved in these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. We're going to work with consumer organisations, those, those organisations which are representing the interests of ordinary citizens who are finding themselves often on the sharp end mm -hmm. of these kinds of transformations. But those organisations are often very well placed to amplify the results of our research, to disseminate and communicate what we're doing, to work through how they might be usefully embodied in policy change or different practices mm -hmm. in, in, that, that might be developed by particular kinds of institutions. So we're really relying on those industry partners f from the very beginning for expertise, for ideas, for access to, to critical research resources, mm -hmm. and of course, for the engagement and impact which is absolutely necessary for a successful large-scale research program like this. And can I ask you a bit about the pace of change? So, um, you know, we, we see these apps, these recommenders coming on stream almost on a daily basis. And, uh, and we're talking about a complex program of research to try to understand that in anticipation, but also in practice and uh, in circumspect. So um, can you talk about the temporal rhythms of this project, how uh, we, we do the kind of understanding and, and feed that into decision making and design in a kind of cyclical manner? That's right. So it's a very, it's a rapidly changing environment. And we're talking about a whole mix of technologies. When we talk about automated decision making, and this is a very important point, we're not talking about a specific technology. This is not just about robots. It's not just about AI. It's not just about the blockchain. It's about all these things, about how they're changing the way automation is going on. They're changing the way our institutions work. They're changing resource allocation and all kinds of important aspects of people's lives across the board. Now that's happening very quickly. The sorts of, the kind of technology we were just talking about, recommendation systems, they were almost nowhere 20 years ago. Yeah. It was Amazon which actually developed them dramatically mm -hmm. and then found that they were rapidly picked up, mm. adopted and adapted using new techniques like machine learning in recent years mm. and, and distributed right across the world of electronic commerce mm. and, and daily life. So now we can't really pass a day without coming into contact with a system like that. They're now in the cloud, they're now extraordinarily cheap. You used to have to employ a horde of highly paid expert computer scientists to develop a bespoke recommendation system. If you wanted such a thing in, a, for example, a university to suggest to students what courses they might be interested in, now it's a simple matter of subscribing to a cloud-based computing service. So these things are literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're widely dispersed. We can expect that to keep going on mm -hmm. with consequences that we don't yet know about. Mm -hmm. But there are also new technologies emerging which are more experimental, which are at an earlier stage of development, where the discussion about things like ethics is much less well advanced. So blockchains are a good example of that. We hear a lot about AI and ethics. We don't hear that much about the blockchain and ethics, but believe me, there are as many problems mm -hmm. with those kinds of systems, and there are likely to be, as there will be with AI. Mm -hmm. So by taking a technology neutral view the centre is going to be able 
to focus on the effects of technological change rather than the mm. machines themselves, as it were, yeah. in order to make a difference where it counts, which is in how these technologies impact on, on ordinary people. Mm. So um, just stepping back and, and just thinking about you know, the next 10 years, we, we've, we've presided in the last couple of decades over kind of widening gaps in inequality uh, and disadvantage. Uh, growing disadvantage across the world, really, in our uh, uh, urban populations. Um, I, I wonder whether um, automation, in, instead of being a problem in exacerbating those already existing problems, could actually become an opportunity to address some of those uh, widening gaps and problems. And if so, that this research could inform that. Can you give us a kind of example or two of how that might happen? Yeah, of course. And, and I mean, this is our view. There are multiple scenarios out there for the effects of automation and where it might take us. We're familiar with the story of increasing inequality, declining productivity, lower, lower wages, uh, lower, lower employment. That's a, that's, a real, that's a real scenario. It's a real possibility. We're also seeing extraordinarily, extraordinary benefits from new automated, automated technologies. So we're seeing, for example, that uh, say in the field of, of, of natural language processing, mm -hmm. the capacity for machines to understand and translate may enable a whole new domain of cultural diversity. It may enable us to keep alive, say for example, indigenous languages, which are now facing extinction because not enough people speak them, not, a, not enough people understand them. And the work and time and resources involved in keeping those languages at the moment is enormously challenging. So there are all sorts of ways in which we think the new technologies of automation have, have great things to offer, but they need to be controlled by citizens, they need to be managed by citizens, they need to be managed by institutions which are operating in the public interest. We find that in health, where we're looking at the development of precision medicine and all kinds of other targeted decision-making systems. We find it in, in we're talking about news and media, uh, that's, that's absolutely the case there, where as well as all of the problems that we're seeing with platforms like Facebook, and, and automated advertising, targeted advertising, those kinds of things. We're also seeing a world of options and capabilities for people to make their own media that haven't existed before. Mm. So we're seeing this in a whole lot of different domains and we want to make sure that those positive opportunities and capabilities aren't lost to Australians because we're, we know too little about the technologies, we know too little about their social impacts, and we're too afraid of them because of that. Thanks, Julian. I'm sure we will be talking with Julian on many future occasions about the progress of the new Centre for Excellence in Automated Decision Making and Society. Thanks.